So today we'll be going over what's called statically indeterminate for an actually loaded member. Now what statically indeterminate means is that we actually need more information than what we did in statics, which were the three equilibrium equations, which were the sum of moments and the sum of forces along the x and y direction being equal to zero. Now there are some problems which require an additional relationship to be able to solve for your, your reactionary forces. So for example, let's say you have a problem such as this. So let's say you had a rod that was constrained between two walls here. You have point A, there's a wall and point B, and we have an external load being um, exerted at point C, the external load being P here. Now, if you were to do the sum of moments or a sum of forces, in this case along the y direction, you would see you would have two unknowns, which are the reactionary forces FB and FA. So you have two unknowns and one equation. Now, if you were to do the sum of moments with respect to any of these points, you wouldn't actually be able to get any further information, and therefore you wouldn't be able to solve for the unknowns in the system. However, when it comes to dealing with strengths of material, we actually have learned um, an additional relationship, which is the deformation, which is equal to the external load times the length divided by the modulus of elasticity times the cross-sectional area. So this is a problem that's considered statically indeterminate because the equilibri equilibrium equations alone aren't enough to be able to solve for the unknowns in these systems. So in this case, you will need an additional relationship, which is the deformation from point A to B, in this case, being equal to zero. And we know this because it's actually constrained between, between these two walls. And so it wouldn't physically be possible for this to elongate or stretch any further. And therefore, the deformation of this rod would be equal to zero. And this would be the additional relationship needed to solve for any unknowns in the system. So let's go ahead and do an example to show you the steps and how to actually solve for problems such as this. So for this example we have the problem statement is if the gap between C and the rigid wall at D is initially 0.15 millimeters Determine the support reactions and at A and D when the force P is equal to 200 kilonewtons is applied. The assembly is made of A36 steel. So we know the modulus of elasticity of A36 steel is 200 gigapascals or 200 times 10 to the 6 kilopascals. So now we have the diameters of each of these rods, right? So we have um, an assembly of these two rods, both made of the same um, A36 steel material, and we have the diameters being 50 millimeters and 25 millimeters with the appropriate dimensions. Now, the difference between this specific problem and what was generally explained previously was that in this case, it's not up against a wall here initially, right? We have a gap of 0.15 millimeters. So this is something important to consider when you're solving for this um, problem here. Now we have a P being equal to 200 kilonewtons being applied at this particular point. B. So we're being asked to solve for the reactionary forces at A, so F, A, as well as the reactionary force at point D once this rod assembly actually um, deforms right to up until the wall since we do have this initial gap. So step one would be to remove um, the constraint at point D here at the end and then solve for the deformation of this entire assembly assuming there is no constraint at this end here. So that would be step one. Let's go ahead and do that. So now redrawing it to show that it's just being constrained at one end and not the other, with this external force being applied to 200 kilonewtons, how much would this assembly actually deform? So let's go ahead and solve for the deformation. 
So plugging into a deformation equation, the deformation from point A to B, because keep in mind, this external load is being applied at point B. So only this first rod would experience the elongation while the other would just be attached to it and also be moving a bit with that deformation. But no force would actually be applied here. It wouldn't compress or wouldn't stretch this rod, right? Only this rod would be stretched by this external external load. Um, so in this case, you would apply the 200 kilonewtons times the length of this first segment, which is 0.6 meters, divided by the modulus of elasticity um, times the cross-sectional area of this particular rod. So in this case, it's 0 0.05 meters squared times pi over 4. So we will have a deformation of 0.31 millimeters. I went ahead and converted it from meters to millimeters right off the bat. So just keep that in mind. So now going back to the rod here, let's say the wall was originally at this portion, right? And now it actually stretched all the way to this portion. So keep in mind, initially we had this small gap of 0.15 millimeters but it, had, it also deformed an additional amount without that restraint of 0.16 millimeters. Since we see the total deformation is 0.31, that initial gap would be filled and then it would stretch a little bit more past that wall that we had. So now, knowing the total deformation of this rod assembly, and we initially removed that constraint, now the second step would actually to determine what force would you require in this case the reactionary force FD what force would you require to deform this rod assembly back up into where the wall is in this case how much force do you need to deform this assembly by 0.16 millimeters and doing this, you will actually solve the reactionary force. So this is actually the method in solving these reactions when it comes to these constraints here. You first initially remove this wall and just see how much the assembly would deform on its own. And then how much force it would take to deform it back to where that wall originally was. Um, and then that's how you would solve for the reactionary forces of this system. Now it gets a little bit tricky when you're dealing with a gap. Just keep in mind you do have that initial gap and that initial deformation does not um, contribute at all to this reactionary force because there is that gap. That's why it's always good to solve for the total deformation initially and how much force would you require to deform it back to where that wall was in this case 0.16 millimeters so the step two is solve for that force needed to deform it back to where the wall would be so now we have the total deformation of the entire rod assembly now keep in mind this rod assembly is composed of two different segments now they're both made of the same material however the di dimensions are in fact different so we have the, in this case, the total deformation of the rod assembly is from point A to point D. So we have the deformation of the first segment of A to B plus that deformation from point B to D here. And we know the total deformation of the entire rod assembly is equal to 0 0.16 millimeters which what we previously solved for so let's go ahead and plug in the equation for the deformations of each of these and solve for the unknown so with these equations we have the unknown fd which we could just factor and we have the original lengths of the rods a b and b d as well as the rest of the information to solve so now let's go ahead and just plug in all the values factor out fd and then solve for it accordingly we get our reactionary force fd being equal to 20.94 kilonewtons so when it comes to the calculations keep in mind to keep all your units consistent if you're dealing with meters um, and kilonewtons make sure everything is the same um, I simplified it a, a little bit because on the right side I did it in millimeters 
but make sure to keep all your units consistent until you have enough practice so that you're able to keep track of everything. It's always a good practice to keep everything consistent and then at the end convert it back to whatever units you're working with or convert everything to a certain unit and then do all your calculations with those units just so there won't be any confusion caused. So now with this reactionary force solved, the only other unknown in this system is Fa. So this is where we utilize one of the equilibrium equations, the sum of force along the x direction being equal to zero. Let's say right going to the right is positive. Fa take away Fd in this case 20.94 kilonewtons, and we have plus 200 kilonewtons, which is our P, is equal to zero. So our FA is equal to negative 179.06 kilonewtons, which actually means that our assumed direction was incorrect and it should be going the other way. So it's equal 179.06 kilonewtons going towards the left. And this is how you solve for the reactionary forces of these kinds of systems when you're dealing with a uh, rod assembly that's constrained between two walls. The equilibrium equations alone aren't sufficient to solve for the reaction forces. And so you have to um, use other relationships, in this case, the deformations, to be able to determine these unknowns. So previously we were using what was called the compatibility equation or the constraint equation for the, the rod being constrained within two walls to solve for the reactionary forces. But the compatibility equation is, also has other useful application when it comes to problems that deals with <clears throat> structures with composite materials, for instance. Let's go ahead and do an example. So the problem statement for this is the steel pipe is filled with concrete and subjected to a compressive force of 80 kilonewtons. Determine the normal stress in the concrete and the steel due to this loading. The pipe has an outer diameter of 80 millimeters and an inner diameter of 70 millimeters and the modulus of elasticity for steel and concrete are given here. So in this case, we're dealing with a structure with composite material, right? In this case, it's composed of two different material. The inside, the outside, we have a steel pipe, and the inside is filled with concrete. Now, when it comes with, um, when it de when you're dealing with structures with composite material, it's usually for reinforcement, right? You add, in this case, some concrete to help um, strengthen the structure, or it could be the other way around. You added the steel pipe to help strengthen the concrete because in this case when you have two different materials one material is going to be experiencing a partial of the load as well as the other so the forces is going to be distributed depending on the strengths of the materials and this is where we're going to be using the compatibility equation so what is the stress well in this case the stress is that external load divided by the cross-sectional area however since we're dealing with a composite um, material composite structure um, each of the materials is going to be experiencing a different force as well as the cross-sectional areas of each of the materials is actually going to be different. So in this case, we use the compatibility equation. So we know that the deformation of the steel is equivalent to the deformation of the concrete since they are working as one um, structure and one component, if one of them deforms and the other one has to deform the same amount because they're working as one part. And so this is the relationship we're going to be using to solve for um, how much force is the steel experiencing as well as how much force is the concrete experiencing. And then we can solve the stresses within each of the materials. So now once you write the equations, we have the force that's experiencing in the steel material times the length divided by modulus of elasticity of the steel and the cross-sectional area is equivalent to the force in the concrete divided by the modular elasticity and the cross-sectional area of that concrete times that length. Since we know the length in this case is 500 millimeters and it's the same, they actually 
cancel out. So now you're able to develop a relationship between the steel force and the, the concrete force of how much one experiences over the other. And doing some algebraic manipulation, this is the relationship you get. So now you can plug in the numbers and just solve for what this constant is to simplify this equation a bit more. So once you plug in the values, just keep in mind when it comes to the cross-sectional area of the steel, you do have to sub subtract the outer diameter um, and the inner diameter. You have to subtract the areas, right? The area of the outside at minus the area of the inside to get the cross-sectional area of the steel. Just keep that in mind. And then plug in the rest and solve for that constant. We actually get a relationship of the force within the steel member is equal to 2.55 times the force in the concrete. So we already see that the steel is supporting most of that load um, with respect to the, the force within the concrete. So now we, that we have this relationship here, what's another relationship that we use? Well, the other relationship is since each of these materials are supporting a certain weight, or a certain load, we have the force of the steel plus the force of the concrete it has to be equal to, to that external load that it's supporting. In this case, it's 80 kilonewtons. So in this case, we have this other relationship that we could use. So now we have two equations with two unknowns. We could go ahead and plug the, the force of steel here and solve for that concrete, um, the force within the concrete. And so plugging in and then solving algebraically, we get 80 kilonewtons divided by 3.55 once we factor out the FC. And we see that the force being um, supported by the concrete is 22.5 kilonewtons. And the force of steel is 57.5 kilonewtons. Now that we are able to see how much, um, how much load does each of the materials support, we could actually solve for that stress in the concrete, force of concrete, divided by the cross-section area, as well as the stress within the steel material being the force in the, force in the steel, a steel, plug in um, and saw for each of the stresses within each of the materials. And so we finally get the stress within the concrete is 5.85 megapascals. And the stress within the stre the steel is 48.81 megapascal. So we could see that there's more stress within the steel than the concrete. That means that there's more, uh, more of the load is being supported by the stress. However, the concrete does in fact um, help in distributing the load. And so this is another application of the compatibility or the constraint equation. And the more you practice, the more you're, you'll be able to apply um, additional relationships beyond the equilibrium equations to be able to solve for any unknowns in any given system that you are analyzing. In this case, when you're dealing with composite materials, sometimes you have to think about it a little bit more. But once you start practicing it more, the relationships become a little bit more obvious of when to apply and how to apply it.